Good morning. Glad to have you with us this morning. And uh, again, I said this last week, but when we say welcome, we really mean welcome. We are glad that you're here. My name is Tim. I'm one of the pastors. And as we, as we jump in here, I just want to, I think sometimes it's good for us to share some of the journey that we're on with God as the preachers. So yesterday I was sanding my front deck, which has been about a 726 year process I've been working on. So, so it's really growing my perseverance. But I was listening to a part of a sermon by um, Dr. Tim Keller out of um, New York City. And he was teaching on prayer and he pressed into this issue of when the Lord, or this idea of when in the Lord's Prayer, when we learn the phrase, Our Father, to start the prayer. And he really, really pressed into that. And so I've been praying in light of that, thinking about the idea of God as Father. And so as we start this morning, I want us to pray. And I'm going to start off by saying Our Father and not the prayer, but just use those words. And I want you to really think about your hopes and expectations of this morning. Like really think about, do you think that your Father in heaven wants to give you something good and beautiful this morning? Maybe from the music, communion, the message, a million different things, but that our good Father actually wants to give us something. So let's pray to that end. Heavenly Father, we pause just to say thank you. And your word says really clearly that for those of us um, who've been gifted the opportunity to be fathers on this earth, that if we know how to give good gifts to our kids when they ask, how much more do you want to give us good gifts? So our prayer and our expectation, Father, is that you'd give us good gifts. We just acknowledge that we're your children. We are desperately in need of your love and your help, your encouragement, your wisdom. So today, as we enter into a time of hearing from you through your word, our prayer is that we would really, truly believe that you have something good and beautiful for us because you are a good father. Help our hearts to get to that place where we really believe that you're going to do something this morning. And we praise you and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So as we uh, started last week, a sermon series that we're going to be going through this summer, talking about the topic of well, what does it mean to be disciples making disciples. Last week, I hit on the idea of eternity being in the balance, right? So eternity is in the balance, and you and I have the opportunity to influence people's eternity. What a, what a blessing that God's given to us. And the reason we talked about that is because Bethany Church... Coming out of Matthew 28, we believe that that command of God is for us to be about disciples making disciples. A disciple is a, a student, a learner, a follower of Jesus. And so we want to help people become disciples. And then we want to build them up and invest in them so they can go out and make disciples as well. So if you just summarize it really quickly, it would be disciples making disciples. You got to be one. You got to make one. And last week was kind of this 50,000 foot flyover talking about the question of motivation and what does it mean to be inspired and motivated to go out and actually do that work of making disciples. Again, to be clear, we don't want to make church goers. We don't want to make churchy people. We don't want to make pew warmers. We don't want to make people who are really active in church but don't know Jesus. We want to be involved in the process of being disciples who are out and making other disciples. There's those two pieces. You got to be a disciple you got to make a disciple. And so kind of digging into that this summer, we're going to look at those two different sides. And so I'm going to be talking about the make one side. The first thing we talked about is why do we go do that? Well, in the big picture, eternity is in the balance. Now to dig down from that maybe 50,000 foot level down to maybe about six feet, we want to get tactical and practical. And the words you're going to hear again and again and again are these three words about connect, serve, and share. Connect, serve, and share. Those are key concepts that we want to kind of help push into our hearts and our minds because we need to connect with people who don't know Jesus. We need to serve people who don't know Jesus. And we need to share the gospel with people who don't know Jesus. Connect, serve, and share. And I'm actually working on a variety of different kind of projects and tools to uh, release and to send out in the fall to help equip us. You know, I think about that commercial, that line that says, you can do it, we can help. That's what our goal as the, as the staff, as the pastors of Bethany Church is. We want to help you to be disciples, and we want to help you to make disciples. So connecting and serving and sharing, those are kind of the key ways that we're going to talk about making disciples. So today we want to dig into this topic of connecting. And when it comes to the idea of um, connecting, it means we're going to be building relationships with people. And the way, the way I phrased it, and you can jot down the notes if this is helpful to you, connecting means we want to connect with people outside the church walls, and we want to connect with one another on mission. 
We want to connect with people outside the church walls, and we want to connect with one another on mission, and I'm going to explain that. So when it comes to the idea of connecting, it's, it's really simple, and maybe for some of us it's really obvious. But connecting means building relationship. Connecting means doing life. Connecting means being with other people. And our hope is that as we connect with people, it'll build the relationship to an opportunity where we can eventually actually share who Jesus is with those people. Now, we don't want this to be formulaic. We want to do it out of a heart of love because the Bible says as God's love transforms us, now we want to actually share that love with other people. But the first step is actually to connect with other people. Pastor Bruce uses this phrase that I love. He says, no contact, no impact. And I think that's a great way of thinking of it. But let's, let's pause and actually just let's reflect on a, a real truth for you and me is that in New England, that can be pretty challenging. Right? Connecting with other people. Now, I've had the opportunity just by traveling and doing different mission trips to really, I think I've been in like 43 out of the 50 states. So I've had a chance to go all over the country. And New England is a unique place. Now, it's interesting because when you talk about kind of church world, people are like, well, the South has got a lot of church stuff going on. And then people are like, well, the Midwest has a lot of church stuff going on. And then California is kind of hit and miss. It's got no church and it's got like these huge churches. So you start looking and you're like, Everybody, or except the Northeast, that's, nobody talks about that. So we're in a unique place when it comes to this idea of church world, but also really even just having relationships. So let me give you two quick anecdotes to prove that that is a fact, even though you probably already know it already. So a handful of years ago, I had a chance to take a group of people, to go with a group of people, down to New Orleans on a mission trip to work on Hurricane Katrina relief. And while we were down there, uh, we arrived at the site and the woman who was in charge of the site said, okay, you have a small group of people working in the house and then the rest of the people have to clean up this pile of trash and move it from the front yard of this house to the dumpster. And this pile was as big as an SUV. It was probably six or seven feet high. It was, you know, 10 feet long or whatever. And so I went to our, our kind of chief carpenter and I said, what do you need from me? He said, well, I need some two by fours and some cement and such. So I drove out to Home Depot, got the stuff. And by the time I came back, probably an hour and a half later, this is no joke, the adults and the students who were working in the front yard had rakes and a broom and they were sweeping up the end of the scrap heap to put it into the garbage can. And so I went up to the woman and I said, okay, what's next? What else do you have for us to do? And she said, well, I don't know, because I thought that was going to take you two or three days. She said, every other group that comes down here, they work for about 15 minutes in the, you know, 98 degree heat with 175% humidity. And then they climb back into the van, they listen to music, they turn on the AC, and then they get back out and work another 15 minutes. And I thought, ah, that's the New England work ethic. We placed a task in front of them. And by the time I got back, they were like, okay, what else you got for us? Right? And we know that there's something about we want to, we are task driven in New England. We want to, here's the goal. Let's accomplish the goal. Now, another place I experienced this was in grad school, and this, I've coined a phrase, it's called New Englanding somebody, <laughs> because it never happened to me anywhere except in New England. So I went to dinner one night with a bunch of grad school friends, and we're sitting there having dinner in the dining hall, and we get done, and so you bring your tray up to the tray return, and I drop my tray off, and I say to my group of friends, five of them or so, I said, I'm going to go get an apple, and then I'll come back, and they all said, okay. So I run around the corner, and I grab my apple, and I came back, and nobody was there. And so I went out into the lobby and nobody was there. I went out of the dining hall and as I looked through the trees down the path, walking into the graduate dorm were my five friends. Because the meal was over, it's time to get back to work. There's no time to wait for people. And you'll notice this, now that I've said it, you're gonna see it everywhere. You go to a Red Sox game and you're hugging the people, you're on the, you, we can't believe we won in the bottom of the 11th, that was amazing. And you're on the tee and you're still hugging and celebrating the game. You get to the parking lot where your car is you bend down to tie your shoe, you look up, and it's a ghost town. <laughs> and people are just like, well, that was fun. I got to move back on to things. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because we are really efficient and focused on the idea of getting the job done in New England. And so the concept of connecting and slowing down to be with people is hard for us. But it's not a game ender. It's just that we need to work maybe a little bit harder than some other cultures do. So we need to connect with people. That's the idea. We need to be doing life and connecting with people. So let me just press a little bit and ask a question. Do you have margin in your life so you can connect with people? Because if you go 125 miles an hour all the time and you're always got the next thing, the next thing, the next thing, you won't have time to connect with people. That's just how it is. And that can go from your spouse to your family to a neighbor, whoever it is. If you are always going, you're not gonna have time to connect. So maybe we need to look at our lives a little bit and say, Man, I need to add a little bit more margin in there if I'm going to actually have a chance to connect with people. 
Now, what I want to do this morning is actually look at this passage from the Gospel of Mark. So you can look in your, um, your pew Bible, or you can also look in your notes there. It's from Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 16. And the reason I went here is because Jesus is the ultimate connector. He's the master at connecting with people. So let me read through the passage, then we're going to dig into it a little bit and figure out how Jesus did this. Mark chapter 2, verses 13 to 16, it says this. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many who followed him. And the scribes and the fair of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? So here's the first key thing I think I want to know is that Jesus spent time with non-religious people. Jesus spent time with non-religious people. He went and engaged with the religious people, but he also spent time with people who had very little affiliation, most likely, with any kind of religious gathering or a religious institution. Jesus was really good at that. He spent time with people who were different. Jesus was really connecting with those types of people all the time. If you read through all the Gospels, you'll see examples of Jesus interacting with people who are considered spiritually and physically unclean, like lepers. He'll spend time with the blind and the lame. He'll spend time with the social outcasts, just connecting and being with them. So much so that he starts to build a reputation that the religious people start looking at him and saying, why are you spending time with all these non-religious people? That's not, that's not okay to do. Jesus, you're a rabbi. You're supposed to be holy. Why are you spending time with these people? So let's just pull back right there and at least see on a base level, if Jesus is the model for your life and mine, then Jesus spent time connecting with non-religious, non-churchy people, and so maybe we should be doing that as well. Well, perhaps it's not a maybe. Absolutely, we should be, should be doing that as well. John 13, 16, we're reminded that Jesus looks at his disciples and says, I'm the master and you're the servant, and there's no servant who's greater than his master. And so what I do, you should do, and what I experience, you're probably going to experience in some way as well. So the two sides of the coin, one is that Jesus spent time with these unchurched people, but also the response of the church people is not, good job, Jesus, it's why are you doing that? So maybe that's just fair warning for you and me. If I start spending time with people who don't come to church, whether it's Bethany or any other church, there's probably going to be church folk who look at me and say, why are you doing that? Don't you know about that person? Don't you know about who that person is or what they do? And I have the confidence in the scripture to just go, yeah, but Jesus did it. And so that's probably a good model. That's something I should do as well. All right, so Jesus connected with these non-church people. And, and we got to dig a little bit and understand that when you, when you hear that, you might say, pastor, no problem. I got all kinds of non-church friends. I spent plenty of time with them. But again, let's dig a little bit and say, do you have a sense in your heart, a healthy weight that you want to see them come to know Jesus? It's one thing to spend time with people who don't go to church. That's good. That's the connecting piece. But is there a deeper piece that you actually desire for people who don't know Jesus to come into a trusting, lifelong, eternal relationship with Jesus Christ? So we got to press a little bit there. Here's a baseline question for you and me. Do I spend time with non-religious people? And I use that term non-religious because you might, if I said people who don't go to church, you might say, I got a good friend. He comes every Easter and every Christmas. And I would say, that's not really a church goer. I'm just talking about people who are not actively involved in the, a fellowship of Christian people. Do you have friends, family, relationship with people who are in that category? And right now, even as I ask, God may just be lovingly in your heart, a little pinprick saying, you know who that person is. Maybe it's family, maybe it's spouse, maybe it's friends, maybe it's neighbor, coworker, whoever it is. Do you spend time with non-religious, non-Bethany, non-church people? Because Jesus did it, and we are called to connect. As I said at the beginning, the idea is to connect with people first. We're talking about the idea of connecting with people outside the church walls. Do we have relationships with people who are not regularly involved at Bethany Church? Let me, let me note here that the call is to faithfulness, not to perfection in doing it. If you're spending time with someone who's not a churchgoer, and you're like, all right, we met once, so next week, they'll probably come to Bethany for the service, and the following week, they're going to go to seminary. We're going to get that all squared away for them. They're going to be a pastor. <laughs> You're probably going to be disappointed. I'm just letting you know. 
So let me just, let me just put it on the table so we, you know we're operating on the same page. I had an opportunity a couple weeks ago to be in New York City on a mission trip. And part of the experience on the mission trip was to go and to uh, do outreach in predominantly Muslim communities. And so the idea is we got some training in the morning and then we just went out and see what kind of conversations God would strike up. But you had to press into those things. You didn't just walk up to somebody and have them say, hey, we know you're from that mission trip. Do you want to talk about Jesus? That didn't happen. We had to open the conversation. So I'm in a, I'm in a butcher shop. Of course, the guys and the girls go out separately and the guys go to a butcher shop. Are you surprised? I'm not surprised. Okay, so we go to the place where meat is available. We walk into the butcher shop. And there's a guy working there and I walk up and he looks at me and he says, you know, what can I get you? And I said, oh no, I'm just looking, which right there is probably not the biggest win. Who goes to a butcher shop to look? That's kind of weird, right? <laughs> it's kind of an odd thing. So he's like, all right. So I'm standing there in line and I'm looking and um, this little, these three little ladies come up next and they're kind of standing in line looking at me like, are you going to buy something? I said, oh, you can let these ladies go. And so I kind of step out of the way and I'm walking around the butcher shop looking and I'm thinking, okay, how, God, how do you want to strike up a conversation here? How do we do this? So the same guy has now left the butcher, butchery area and he's at the counter. And so I walk up to him and I'm buying a drink and I said, do you own the shop? And he just looked at me and went, hmm. Huh. And I said, do you own the, the shop? And he went, hmm, uh. And he turned and said in a different language to the guy who was working at the cash register or something. And that guy turned to him and said, no, he doesn't own the shop. We all just work here together. And so I went, okay. <laughs> and I bought my drink and I left. And I walked out on the sidewalk and I was like, well, that was different. <laughs> so you don't always hit it out of the park, but it was the effort and the faithfulness to even try to connect with somebody. Maybe you've done that like for an invitation for Christmas or from the heart or from Easter, Easter service. You've reached out to somebody. Our neighbor, really nice guy, has he and his wife, um, Jenny, my wife, has kind of made a connection with them. And so the wife bought some toys for our kids for Easter. And the husband brought it over while I'm uh, out working on my car one day. And he comes and says, hey, this is for your kids. And so I strike up a conversation with him and said, hey, we're doing this sunrise service down at the ocean. And then there's, there's a bunch of services at the church. We'd love to have you guys come. And he just looked at me and went, okay. And then turned and walked back to his house. But again, that's, if I do it just one shot, I try to say, well, God, I try to give up. That's not really the effort to connect. We need to continue to engage with people to say, it's important that we're connecting with people. As I was writing this sermon, as I was working on sermon prep, I get a, a phone call. I look down and it's a buddy of mine who I made friends with kind of through some circuitous situations. He lives out in uh, Utah, he's a Mormon. And so I'm thinking, I gotta finish my sermon about connecting with people who don't know Jesus in a deep and personal way. I'm too busy for this. Wait a minute. <laughs> so I answer the phone call and I talk to him for a little bit and yet slowed down my sermon prep, but it's just the effort to say, am I connecting with people who don't know Jesus, people who are outside the church walls? That's a really important thing according to Jesus. And as we look in this passage, he was doing it regularly enough that people started accusing him of spending time with the tax collectors and sinners. Look in the passage again in verse 14, just these few words. It says, and as he passed by, and as he passed by, that implies Jesus was on his way somewhere. He was doing something and in the process of going to that place, he stopped, he paused, he interacted with this gentleman named Levi. As he passed by, it's probably because he's a rabbi, he's a teacher, he's a communicator, he's an educator. And as he's walking, he's teaching people and he's going to different places to do that. But as he's going to a place to teach, in the process, he reaches out to Levi, which leads me to believe from the passage that sometimes Jesus connected with them in everyday life. That it wasn't always, Jesus didn't always wake up in the morning and say, today I'm going to go find Levi, he's at the tax collector's booth, and I'm going to talk to him about me and what it means to have a relationship with me. Jesus was doing life, and as he did life, he made the effort to connect with people. So here's a possible application for you and me. Do you have kids in sports? Maybe it's an opportunity to connect with other parents at practices or at games. Do you buy food at the grocery store? Maybe you can connect with somebody at Market Basket or Shaw's or Hannaford or wherever you shop. Do you go to the, the gym? Maybe you connect, could connect with somebody after your jazzercise class. <laughs> if you're still jazzercising, come talk to me later. We have some other things to work through. 
do you walk your dog on a regular basis? If you do, maybe you can start connecting with people in your neighborhood because you're walking the dog. My wife, this is no joke, I call her the mayor of Newmarket because she is always talking to people. She says, I'm going downtown to get coffee. And like an hour and a half later, I'm like, did they get the beans from Columbia directly? Like what happened? Oh, I struck up a conversation with this person, that person. My wife takes the double stroller, two kids, two dogs, and goes for an hour walk regularly. She now has a reputation with some of the ladies that she sees on a regular basis walking of like, she's the lady with the two dogs and the two kids and we don't know how she does it. But she's always striking up conversations with people because she's out and about. So if you're out doing something, do you have an opportunity to connect with people who you might see on a regular basis? Here's the bottom line is that if you don't live alone on a mountaintop 10 miles from everybody else, you probably have neighbors. In New England, going to talk to a neighbor is a huge way to connect because nobody does that. Or just going up and knocking on the door and saying, hey, it's nice to meet you. I've lived here for 72 years and we've never talked. <laughs> it's simple. Just having a conversation, start, start to build a relationship and connect with people who are not necessarily here on a Sunday morning in the church walls. Jesus did that. And it usually is the first means that we get into having a relationship with somebody so that in the long term, we can love them enough to actually engage them about who Jesus is to us. We have to connect with people. There's another way we need to connect, and that's connecting with one another on mission. So we want to connect with people outside the church walls. We also want to connect with one another on the mission that God has placed in front of us. Now, let me just give you an example of why that's important, because the deal is you and I can't do this mission thing on our own only. Yes, you're going to have neighbors that I don't have. Yes, you're going to know people that I don't know. And you're going to have to connect with them for the sake of Jesus and to share the gospel with them. But there's a way in which we as a Christian community are called to do that together. Here's my story, right? Let's just take it as a hypothetical example. I reach out to a neighbor. We strike up some conversation. We're talking about the Red Sox and gardening and the amazing politics of Newmarket, New Hampshire. And as we talk more and more, we start to build a relationship. And I go and talk to him the next week and we strike up another conversation. Eventually, we get to the place where we talk about what we do for jobs. And he tells me what he does. I tell him what I do. At that point, what, what usually happens is people start apologizing for how much they've swore in the last conversations. <laughs> happens all the time, right? Doesn't that happen all the time? Yeah. They're like, oh no, you know God personally, huh? I'm like, okay. So we have a conversation and then eventually I say, hey, you know what? I'd love to have you come and attend one of our church services. And he says, yeah, I'll do it. So he says, okay, I'll come. So he comes and I talk to him. He says, that was amazing. I have not been to a church like that. Man, it's so different. And so we talk more, come back next week. Okay, he comes and he, we talk more and more. And he says, man, I'm building a relationship with God. And after a couple months of regularly attending a Bethany church, he comes up to me and he says, God is doing something in my life. I just want to say thank you for even striking up the conversation and inviting me. But imagine if he looked at me and said, but here's the weird thing. Can you just tell me why is it every time I go to your church services on Sunday morning, Nobody else talks to me. Wouldn't that be weird? I mean, that's not a witness of the loving community of Christ. There's something about us connecting with one another on the mission that God has for us that speaks to people who don't know Jesus. I, I've had a conversation with a gentleman one time who said, my job is to bring my friend and I kind of plop them down and then you do the work. And I thought, well, I'll do the work that God's called me to do, and maybe it's having a conversation, maybe it's preaching, but this is an us thing. That's why whenever I do the values moment and you look at the camera and we say, hey, if you're watching online, we're, we're glad you're watching online, sign up for the, the who's there in the air. But I always make a point to say, hey, we'd love to see you here in person. Because here's the deal. I understand if people are shut in or sick or out of town, if there's legitimate reasons to not come. But if on a Sunday morning, I just think, well, I'll just watch online. It's the same thing. What you are doing, if you're a follower of Jesus, is you're robbing the body of Christ and you're robbing other people who maybe don't know Jesus the opportunity to engage with you. You bring things to the table according to the Bible that we're the body of Christ and we all play different roles. And so I'm going to bring what I bring to the table. But how do you know that you aren't the key element to reach out to my neighbor because he bumps into you out there in the, having coffee? You could be that key person. I joke around all the time about my friend Carol that when I would, I would get done preaching sometimes and I'll be leaving and Carol will be sitting in the back talking to somebody. And I would, I'd say to Carol later on, hey, who's that you were talking to, a friend of yours? Oh no, this woman just sitting there. She looked kind of sad and so I sat down and talked with her and an hour later, they're still having a conversation. 
That's a gift that she has, just able to strike up those conversations and connect with somebody in that way. So you and I, we need to be on mission together. This isn't just for somebody else to do or us to do individually. We need to be on mission together. And this passage from Acts, I think, speaks to this concept beautifully. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 to 47. Now, the context of this passage is that Jesus has lived, crucified, resurrected, ascended back to heaven. The followers of Jesus now have been given the spirit of God to be about the mission of God, which is to go to the whole world and to make disciples. Peter preaches this powerful message at the religious festival of Pentecost, and many people, it says 3,000, came to faith. And then after that, it says this in verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who are being saved. So what's the church doing? In this setting, the message has been preached, people are coming to faith, and then the community of God's people are living on mission together. And that process is that they're, they're getting teaching, they're spending time together. It says they're breaking bread. Some scholars say that's literally communion. Other people say that's just a meal together. And they're praying together. And then it says, I want to read, let me read the exact line so I make sure I'm quoting it properly. And awe came upon every soul, and many signs and wonders were being done through the apostles. Awe came upon every soul. Now, who's the every soul? Is it just the believers? It could be. More accurately, it's probably that when God has his people on mission together, that everybody seems to see the benefit of it. There's something about the Christian church being the church and doing it together that the world might just look and say, there's something about that. I'm attracted to that. I'm intrigued by that. I love the story of this one pastor I like to listen to. Matt Chandler says, when he became a Christian, his friend kept on inviting him and inviting him to come to youth group. And he would go and he would just scoff the entire time. He would say, this is so cheesy. This is so stupid. This is a hokey. And then when his friend would drop him off, he said, do you want to come back next week? He said, yeah, pick me up at six. <laughs> there was something he liked to make fun of, but there was also something really deep and profound about what was going on there that he said, I'm drawn into that. What's going on there? And so when Christians, when church people are connecting to one another on mission, the world seems to look and take something away from that and say, oh, I'm intrigued. What's the next, what does it mean to actually be in a community like that? So when we connect with one another, it actually makes a difference here with other people. You and I can't do mission just on our own. We have to do it with other people as well. Look at verses 44 to 46 here. Again, it says, and all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing uh, the proceeds to all as they had need. And day by day, attending the temple together, which kind of be a church gathering, right? And breaking bread in their homes, they received their, received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Now, if we go to the book of Acts and say, it's going to be this way all the time, every time, we're probably not handling the scripture properly. But it does give, give us a picture of what the early church looked like and that praising God and that fellowship and that being on mission together led to, according to that last verse and the, Lord, the last section of that verse, and the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. There's something about you and me as individuals reaching to those who are outside the church walls, connecting, doing relationships and life with those who are outside the church walls. But as we do relationship together on mission, it seems to impact the unbelieving world. And they look and they say, there's something about that. There's something about when Christians do life together, people who are following Jesus do life together, that the world looks and knows that the love of God is actually a real thing. So we need to connect with those outside the church walls. We need to connect with people who are on mission together as Christians. You can't do mission alone. I can't do mission alone. We can't do this connecting thing alone. We need to do it as a community as well as individually. 
That's what we're called to do. And this is not, this is, this should not end up as an obligation. This should end up as an opportunity and a joy. Because again, let's just be honest, right? If you and I really dig into our hearts, there's probably part of us that goes, you want me to connect with people who see the world totally differently than I do? You want me to connect with people who don't have any interest in coming to church? No, don't talk to the waiter, talk to the cook. I'm just delivering the goods. If you say, I don't know why God would want to do that, then you need to talk to him about that. Because I know for me, when I got that phone call, I was kind of like, eh, I'm really busy doing church work. God had to, in that moment, say, you're really busy doing what? what? This is what you're, you're trying to teach people about this? But okay, yes, yes, Lord. That's a heart level thing that maybe we need to dig into our hearts and say, God, why is it that I don't want to connect with people? Because you and I get to play a role in influencing the eternity of people. There is no better deal than that. Paul, when he writes to the church of Thessalonica, talks about the fact that he's helped them to come to faith and actually grow in their faith and start a church there. He describes them as his crown. And the picture there is that when Paul dies and goes to heaven and he's rewarded for his earthly work for Jesus, that he will look and if God says, what have you done for me while you were on earth, Paul? Paul would look and point to these people and go, God, this is what I did. So you have the opportunity to say, man, I could influence somebody's eternity and one day stand before God. And I said this last week, but I am positive that we will have conversations with people in heaven and we're gonna go, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know you. And they're gonna go, well, you did this and this and this and this. And that through a circuitous situations ended up with me coming to faith in Jesus. And I'm here because you were faithful in the moment. Who knows about the awkward conversation in a butcher shop in Long Island and how that might influence that guy just a little bit. I don't know. Try to be faithful in the moment and call me, call and follow what God calls me to do. And after that, just trust the rest of him. We as the people of God need to connect with those outside the church walls. We need to connect with those who are here inside the church walls on mission. Let me level one final challenge and encouragement to you. People don't leave churches because the church is too friendly. That doesn't happen. I've never talked to someone who's like, I went to your church, man. Everybody was saying hi. They gave me free coffee. They were nice to me. I'm not ever going back there. <laughs> that doesn't ever happen. Now, it may be awkward to have some of those interactions with people who are new, but if you're here and you're a regular attendee at Bethany Church, you're a member, a regular attendee, whatever it is, you get to play the role on a Sunday morning for somebody who comes in and maybe is trying to figure out who God is, trying to start a relationship with Jesus, is in a really hurting place. You get to play the role of reaching out to those people. It's not an obligation of the church staff. It's something that we all get to do together in the church walls and outside of the church walls. And this is a gift God has given us to be involved in the process of loving people here on earth. And we trust by his grace straight through into eternity. What a great opportunity that he's given us. Let's pray. Father, you are good to us. You have dealt with all the sin and the junk in our lives. You dealt with that through your son on the cross. And so now when you look at us, you look at us with favor. You look at us to pour out goodness and blessing. And the scripture says clearly that you work all things together for the good of those who love you. So if we love you, then you want to actually do a work in us so we can love others. So I pray that you would stir in our own hearts, God, to help us examine when we think about connecting with people who don't yet know G Jesus, who maybe never go to church, who aren't religious at all, you'd help us to look at our own hearts and stir in us a longing and a desire and not just a job to do, but an affection for you and in turn for people. That is the greatest command, to love you first and then to love our neighbor as ourselves. So help us to do that. Help us to connect with people outside the church walls and then also to connect with one another on mission. Help us to be about what you want us to be about, God. There is no plan B. There is no second chance. There is no somebody else is going to do it. You want us to play a role in the redeeming work you're doing in the world. So we say thank you for it. And we say give us strength and wisdom and encouragement to actually go and do it individually and together. We bless you and we look forward to what you're going to do in and through us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.